The first of our lightning talks this afternoon will be given by Stephanie Kearns. Stephanie is the head of education and outreach and the curriculum librarian at the Feinberg School of Medicine at Northwestern University. She's responsible for overseeing the library's education program and outreach activities and for creating and evaluating a program for training students, faculty, and residents in information management. She's heavily involved in the curriculum renewal process currently underway, it sounds like fun, um, which started with the creation of the competency-based curriculum for the MD program in 2009. Uh, next, we'll have Jim Brooker. Jim Brooker is the instructional design librarian at Galter Health Sciences Library at the Feinberg School of Medicine, Northwestern University. I'm sensing a theme here. He obtained an MSLIS from University of Illinois and is an active member of MLA. At Galter, Jim designs and programs online tutorials, creates and delivers digital video, provides instructional design consultation to medical school faculty, and co-chairs the library's assessment committee. And I'm, you know, given all that other stuff he does, I'm really surprised to read this uh, this last line, um, as the father of an 18-month-old, Jim's little free time is spent brushing his teeth and doing laundry. I'm surprised you have that much time. Um, Deb Werner received her MLIS from Dominican University in River Forest, Illinois. She's currently a science reference librarian biomedical specialist here at the John Carrar Library at the University of Chicago and is interested in library instruction in both academic and clinical settings. And so um, I'm going to get you set up here, and without further ado, we'll, we'll launch into the session. Good. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, very quickly, I'm going to go over the background. I will start my timer. Okay, so over the background of what I was doing. Um, in 2009, uh, Feinberg School of Medicine created a competency based education for the MD program, and there are eight competencies total. Um, in the medical decision making course, which I teach with, uh, I'm one of five faculty um, in that course. We decided to use uh, one of the competencies, continuous learning and quality improvement, because there were two objectives that um, included information management. So I just wanted to point out the handouts that you have. One is the assignment that I actually gave, and um, I wanted to make a point about that because what I'm assessing is actually the skill. So I teach in this course for, it's a five-day course, the very beginning of the first year of the medical school. Um, uh, for the yeah medical class and um, it's all I, I teach three days two hours each day in a lecture format and I use turning point clickers to keep it very interactive and they bring your laptops we do a lot of hands-on searching that sort of thing so at the very end the assessment that I have for the students is a hands-on demonstrate the skill I want to see that they understand the process and show it so that is what I'm actually doing the color thing here is the feedback form that I'm talking about. So the, on the front page, you'll see the two competencies that I'm talking about. And these are competencies that are assessed. Anybody, any faculty member in the medical school that is assessing an information management competency uses this. So I didn't create it. It was created by the medical school. Um, okay, so that's the course. That's the competency. 2009, I was the first year for the assignment, the first year for the competency. 2010, I kind of tweaked things based on what I learned, what worked and what didn't. Okay, so just very briefly about 2009, um, you can see on the form that there is a rubric in addition to giving a numeric score for, um, for the, uh, with anchors, I was required to give two fields of comments for each student, and that's on the back. Um, this is kind of part of the what didn't work, because I, wasn't, I did not know I was supposed to do this. Um, there's positive observations, suggestions for improvement. Um, I found out about that after I had handed out the assignment to the students, and I didn't have kind of a standardized comments to give back to this, you know, to fill this out. So um, just a point about our medical school class, it's 175 students. I was the only one grading these, and as you can see on the assignment, there are two searches. So 175 times two, I had to give comments on all of those. It took a long time. Um, also, uh, the medical information systems department didn't have the online portfolio up until October. The class is in August. So students did, did not get their feedback until after Christmas not very effective feedback when you don't get it long enough until you've forgotten about the assignment. So the second year, um, what we learned, what we changed. 
Um, the dean in charge of competency implementation asked me to add a new competency. So actually, the form you're seeing is what we used this year. So there is a third one, third competency, um, where I had to assess their writing skills because I am one of very few people in the medical school curriculum at this point who is grading and providing feedback on the medical school's writing. I'm sorry, the medical students' writing skills. Um, I did create a scoring rubric um, for their feedback comments, which was actually pretty easy to do because they all do similar things with the searches that they perform, um, and that saved a lot of time. The other thing that didn't work that, was, that had changed, and this was across the board, those where you see the yellow, um, those are kind of anchored. The, there's a lot of grading inflation, as I think there is in a lot of schools, and um, the students viewed my grading as very, I was a hard grader because I would read the anchors and grade them according to the anchors. A lot of uh, faculty would say, oh, the student's great, and give them a nine. So I would give somebody a three, and they'd say, oh, this, you know, she's really hard. So those um, yellow is where a first year student at the beginning of their first year should be. So the expectations of the students were set. Um, and they understood what the rubric meant. So that's what we changed in the second year. Very quickly, the evaluation of the assessment. We don't really have thing, anything more than just kind of anecdotal. The feedback from the faculty in the medical decision making course has been positive. Feedback from the faculty in the problem-based learning course has been extremely positive, which is, matters a lot to me because that's the course where the students use their searching skills first. And then objective data from students. At this time, we don't have any, but this is a problem throughout the curriculum. We're doing this curriculum renewal, and this is an issue that's going to be addressed. <laughs> Um, okay, so I'm going to tell you about a uh, peer assessment approach that we did at Galter. Um, there we go. So I'm teaching PubMed, and I'm really going. I'm, I'm you know, I'm, I'm in a in a groove, and uh, that guy's sleeping. I can see that guy sleeping, and there's a voice in in the back of my head that's just like, "What what are you doing? You're just going on and on." That person's asleep. Oh, that person's asleep now too. <laughs> You know, and it's just, you know, this happens because you, you basically are just broadcasting material, blasting it at people, and by the end of it, everybody's exhausted and you're not really sure what happened. So I knew at that point that uh, I really wanted to have some kind of uh, self-reflection, some kind of idea of how I was teaching and, and uh, what I was doing. So, you know, it seemed kind of straightforward. How am I doing? Look in the mirror. But the reality is it's kind of more like this kind of mirror where there's just all of these different facets involved in it, things that you don't really want to ask your, your students. Um, can you hear me? Can you see me? Can you smell me? All this other stuff. <laughs> you know, all, all of these, these things that you get at a little bit in an evaluation, but it's just a little tedious to get to dig that deep to find out if, if your instructional style is, is effective or, or how things are going. And our evaluations weren't too bad, so by the end of it, they were, I guess, being nice to me or something, but um, they weren't really getting at the thing that I knew, which was the problem, is that the guy's asleep. So um, basically, uh, we decided to, to come up with a, with a, a rubric approach to um, kind of getting it all down of, of what we do, uh, which sounds uh, kind of simple, but now we're at this. Um, <laughs> Which is that there's still a lot of facets, and we have to we have to kind of isolate them and group them and such. Um, so uh, so we proceeded with doing that, and, and in the action of doing that, in the action of, of solving this, um, it started to to go beyond just is the person speaking well and, and things like that, and we started including facets of our classes that were things that we were aspiring to for all of our classes, just uh, basic instructional design facets like interactivity, like um, catching people's attention at the beginning with a disco ball and other things like that. But basic th things that we wanted all of our classes, even if the topic was a little different to, to hit. So uh, there is a, a handout in your folder. Um, mine is color, yours, yours is not. Um, <laughs> But basically, this is what we arrived at. So um, this is this is a, a kind of a I don't know what one would call this a short form rubric. It's 
it's long, but it doesn't have within all of these boxes, it doesn't have the actual description of things. So what we did was we got together and came to an agreement on what these meant. Uh, we did a pilot session of it on me as the guinea pig and then refined it as it, as it went along so that we ended up with something that everybody kind of understood. And by everybody, I mean there were four of us. This was a, a group of, of uh, teaching librarians. So then what we do is uh, attend each other's classes and rate each other. Um, so what you get from this, the possibilities, um, are basically that you're able to provide constructive feedback to your peers uh, in, a, in a, a, a positive way, um, in a kind of codified way. So uh, we're, we're able to isolate um, elements of our instruction that we needed, personal instruction styles that we needed to work on. We're able to create goals based on those and subsequently measure, repeat the process and measure to see if those goals were met. But also we were able to break down the structure of our classes and find out, okay, I just spent, you know, in my class I spent 15 minutes talking about mesh. I really could only need to spend about five minutes talking about it and I have this other time that opens up during which I can insert an activity or the, basically um, group analyzing, giving us tool for the analysis of the class structure to find out where can we retool these classes to make them more interactive and more interesting to our users and stop people from falling asleep. So the end result is back to the disco ball, but hopefully the positive end of the disco ball in that we have a class that has been redesigned. We are able to make intelligent decisions about our classes and make them sparkle or make them more interesting um, and make ourselves a little more interesting in the process. Um, so um, the librarians, uh, right here, Stephanie is one, and uh, Linda and Pam. And also when I got started uh, designing the rubric, uh, I did uh, refer to a few of the medical school faculty and staff who helped me uh, get started with that. So that's it. All right, now I'll start my time. OK. <laughs> um, so I'm Deb Warner, and uh, I am going to talk about assessment on the fly using clickers to assess learner comprehension in real time. And everybody should have a little clicker. Um, you may find it under your chair. Uh, thanks to the cameramen for suggesting putting it on the chair as they were sliding down, a la Oprah. Um, unlike Oprah, you cannot keep these. It's not a parting gift. We will need these at the end. Um, so there we go. OK. So I think we've heard the word clicker a few times today, um, but just for those of you who have not used them or heard about them, uh, clickers are also known as audience response systems. And it's a technology that enables interactive presentations and allows the instructor to get feedback from the students, from the audience. And you can collect data from this feedback and, of course, perform assessment. Um, it consists, the, the audience response system consists of these um, devices, these response devices, a receiver, which we have here on the computer, which is essential. I've tried to start a session without plugging my receiver in, and it does not work. Um, and then there's software also that we've installed on this computer that you also have to get going in order for it to work. There are next generation systems out there uh, that will turn your student's laptop or mobile device into a clicker. Um, and that I'm really excited about because one of the barriers I've found is actually distributing these to a larger group, getting them back, um, putting myself in the queue to even use these because they're managed by our audiovisual services and not the library. So if we can bypass this, I think it would be a great improvement. Okay, so let's get started with your clickers, everyone. Um, if you haven't used them before, there's a little one, a little two, just the numbers. You can answer the question. And the polling is now open. And so the question is, have you used clickers in instruction? Just to warm the audience up, which is something I like to do to get people's attention and make sure they're um, awake and interested. So what do you do? So you press the number one or the number two on your clicker. And if you change your mind, you can press a different number, and it will, uh, it will change your response for you. OK. And I'm going to close polling now, because this is only five minutes. <laughs> OK, so here 59% uh, said no, they have not used clickers. So about 60% and a little over 40 have. So great. All right, so let's talk then about assessment with clickers. 
You can build pre and post tests into your presentation using polling slides. And you just saw an example of a polling slide. I used the turning point software to get that slide in, and then everybody could respond with their clicker. Um, and the great thing about this is that the instructors and the students get immediate feedback when you're teaching a concept. So you have your pre-test, and you see what the students know, and then you can teach the concept and do the post-test and see what the students know. And of course, the students see it as well, and it's immediate. If, they're, if you notice there's a problem, um, they're not grasp being, grasping a concept, then you have the opportunity right then to reteach that concept, as opposed to a lot of assessment in a one-shot session where you get the assessment at the very end, you get the results at the end, and if there's a problem, there's nothing you can do to address it to that particular group of students. You'll address it for the next session. With clickers, you have the opportunity right then and there to address any, any issues in learner comprehension, which I find great. Um, and then also, the responses are anonymous. And depending on the audience, this is very important. Um, in the summer here, I teach some high school students that come in through the Pritzker Medical, student, or medical School for these pipeline programs, and they do not speak. They won't answer questions. <laughs> they're very shy. They're reluctant to talk. They're reluctant to show that they don't know something. But using clickers, then they have the opportunity to answer without revealing any ignorance on a subject. So it really helps um, engage certain groups of, of students. So this is an example of a class of high school students. Um, and I was teaching the concept of Boolean operators, because they were going to be doing research with faculty here and doing searches. So the first um, graph here is the pretest. And 54.6% got it right. I, mean, I gave them a scenario of um, and when you would use a Boolean operator, and they had to, they had to decide whether they would use and or, or not. So um, before we really talked about it, 54.6% uh, got it right. And then I had the opportunity to teach the concept and then present uh, the scenario again, a slightly different scenario to see if they understood it, and then 81.8% did understand it. If it had been lower, I would have taught again, um, but it was a pretty decent number. Um, it's the opportunity then to say, if you have questions, if you didn't quite get it, you can see me after the session. We can talk more. You've got my email address. Um, but it gave you the chance to, again, address any issues right away. So now we're going to try it here for all of you. We'll do a little sample. So how many glass panels are in the Mansueto Library Dome? One, two, or three are your responses. You see the corresponding number. And you've got two more seconds. OK. So here we see the responses. 7% said 240, 40% said 499, and 53% uh, said 691. So now I'd have the opportunity to teach the subject. You can actually look this up in your handout that you have in your packet. <laughs> um, Mansueto Library by the numbers. Everybody's got one. And, or you could talk to a friend, and then we can reassess. Here's the post-test. So you've got a minute to talk amongst yourselves. Look at the handout. And the polling will close in 15 seconds, because I'm already over. All right, polling is closing in five seconds. The numbers are still trickling in. OK, we'll stop the polling here. Ooh, 98% got it right. Congratulations. All right, thank you very much. I do need the clickers, remember.